my wife and my daughter recognised that I needed help. And, and they also realised just, just how isolated I am. I couldn't get involved and, and, and the, the mood change because when you're sitting there and you don't know what's going on, you, you're going to just go into yourself. Well, if you, if you say, if you say we were out for a meal or out in a pub, uh, they would notice that I'd be just sitting there and not understanding and not getting involved and, and, and they, they'd notice a mood change. Your mood would change because you're sitting there, you're not enjoying the fun, you're not enjoying the, the conversation and, and, and you know, you, you, the isolation is, is obvious that you, you, you may as well not be there. She would say, you know, what was wrong with you, you know? And, and eventually you got to the stage where she didn't have to ask what was wrong. She, she identified that they could see what was happening. It was like, you, you, you go from somebody who's happy-go-lucky uh, to, to, to somebody who just isn't involved. And uh, like, at, at one time you could say, yeah, I, I, I was always involved in the phone, I was always involved. And they could notice that uh, I just wasn't getting involved anymore. It, it was just the matter of me sitting there and not understanding, not hearing what's going on. No, no, this has been going on for years. This is, like, I, I'd been kicking the can down the road for years and years. Uh, I knew, I knew my hearing was, was damaged and I knew it wasn't getting any better. And I knew it was worsening. Uh, and I, I, I was choosing to ignore it. Uh, not for any real reason other than, you know, it's, I felt it was something I didn't really need to do. But it's only in, in hindsight now, and, and, and now that I have the hearing aids, I realise I should have done it a long, long time ago. is probably one of the most important senses that we have at the end of the day. There are various factors that affect our hearing and, and certainly in adulthood probably the most significant factor is ageing. It's something we can't get away from unfortunately and our hearing loss as we get older is usually a combination of a number of things. One, ageing and that can have a genetic basis, how the implica implications for that but it also depends on level of noise exposure that you've had throughout your lifetime, whether that be a recreational noise or whether it's work-related noise or whether it's through a, a noise and a trauma. But the hearing itself, when it starts to change, we first notice the sound starts to become a little bit muffled and then gradually that starts to affect our ability to understand speech, possibly a little bit in the noise. First of all, when there's background noise, it becomes more and more challenging. And what you'll find then is people tend to become more isolated, they're not communicating so much because of the difficulties they're facing, and that leads to a lot of isolation for patients, particularly as their hearing loss starts to progress if they're not utilising any particular devices like hearing aids to help them get their, to improve their hearing. That isolation itself is not great for, for people's mental health, ultimately. And often the, the, the patient themselves are not aware of those changes because it is so slow and insidious. It's not uncommon for our our friends and our family to start to be aware of some of the early problems to start off with because they might be mishearing some of the sounds or you may be giving the wrong answers to some of the questions etc. You tend to find as it progresses you might not hear so well in the background noise so often if you're outside in, in a noisy shopping centre or you might find that you wasn't hearing your colleagues or one of those kind of environments there and sometimes you might find that the louder sounds still are quite loud, but you're just not hearing the softer sounds so, so clearly. So those tend to be the first stages, and as that hearing loss progresses further, you're starting to Im Im bring in more of the other frequencies. So typically it starts at the higher frequencies. It's a gradual roll-off from the low frequency to the high frequencies. But with time, that starts to progress more and more to those other frequencies, which are really important for understanding speech, even in a quiet-type situation. Typically with ageing, it's generally we're looking at the inner ear that becomes damaged by age and noise exposure over the years, as well as any other medical conditions that we've had or infections, etc., that can have an impact in terms of the inner ear hair cells. Once the inner hair cells are damaged by whatever the cause, they don't grow back. 
unfortunately. So you're left with some level of hearing loss and that's where we need to get the interventions, which is usually the hearing aid. But it does depend upon the degree of hearing loss as to what's the best options for patients. I think one of the things that's noted in literature is typically when someone starts to become aware of a hearing problem, is is a good 10 years before they actually start to do anything about their hearing, unfortunately. And we now know that the earlier you start to get your hearing test and manage, the better the long-term outcomes are going to be for that individual. There are a number of studies now that are starting to look at hearing loss and dementia, and there's a link between the two. There seems to be some indications that if you have hearing loss that's untreated, that that can have significant impact in terms of dementia that somebody has. And that's probably related to um, the brain resources that we have. And that what happens is as we start to get older and we start to get dementia, then if you have a hearing difficulty that's unmanaged, you're pulling more and more of those brain resources that are available to try and help you understand and decipher what's happening in terms of the speech, in terms of getting the best intelligibility and understanding what's going on and piecing together sentences that you're not quite hearing properly. And that's because the part of the brain that had been active has actually gone to sleep. It's not been stimulated over the years. And so what happens is, as more and more of those brain resources are being used to try and help with the communication, it's taken away from the cognitive functions where you really need to be able to utilise that, that brain power to be able to cope generally. So by having our hearing assessment at an earlier age, we would identify any level of a hearing loss starting and be able to manage that. And what that means in the long term, what we think happens in the long term, is it means that you will have hearing, that you'll be able to hear very well, keep that brain active, and therefore those resources that are important as we get older and we start to get dementia can be utilised for more important cognitive functions that's required. Christine McGarrigal, I'm a Senior Research Fellow at Trinity College Dublin. I'm interested in the social determinants of ageing. Um, to do that we use TILDA, which is the Irish Longitudinal Study on Ageing. We started in 2009, we recruited 8,500 people aged 50 years and older. They're a nationally representative sample, we go back to them and re-interview them every two years. And what this means is because we follow the same people, we can look at changes in health and well-being over time, but also we can investigate changes that happen in circumstances or changes that happen at certain events that might happen and how they can then impact on health and well-being. So what we do is we interview people every two years. We ask them detailed questions using a computer-assisted personal interview. But then as part of that, which makes us kind of unique for other European studies, is we also do um, a health assessment. So people come into our centre and we look at various uh, physical and cognitive function tests and from that we're able to see how well people are doing in their ageing process. And then hand it back to me, okay? okay? So when we start we do a baseline measurement. We do physical, social and economic characteristics. So they can include anything from well-being, um, mental health, social participation, how well people are integrated within their community and their networks. Um, and then the health tests are quite varied, they're cardiovascular, cognitive. And then also we find about their economic circumstances too. We found it 42% of the older population that we asked in 2018 reported hearing loss. But despite that high prevalence of hearing loss, um, hearing age use was actually quite low at only 11%. People who had poor hearing, women in particular who had poor hearing and didn't wear hearing aids, were, um, had less lower social participation and were less socially engaged in their communities than people who um, wore hearing aids. We also looked at mental health and mood and what we found was that people with fair or poor self-rated hearing without hearing aids had worse mental health and well-being. They had higher depressive symptoms, higher loneliness and lower quality of life. Those differences didn't seem to be there when people wore hearing aids, which suggests again that those differences were alleviated by the use of hearing aids. There certainly seems to be barriers to hearing aid use. They vary from cost, been primarily one of them, potentially not having um, insurance coverage, 
some discomfort, maybe not enough information on how to use them or maintain them, but although cost is probably the substantial barrier, stigma certainly remains about hearing aid loss and other studies have certainly found that even in countries where the cost of hearing aid use is completely covered. So my name is Brian Lawler, I'm Professor of Old Age Psychiatry at Trinity College Dublin. And I was a consultant psychiatrist at St James's Hospital for the past 31 years. And I developed the services in the area, I set up a memory clinic uh, at St James's Hospital and dealt with a lot of people, older people, who had depression, anxiety. And many of these individuals later in life, in addition to having depression, anxiety, would have had hearing impairment and visual impairment. And it was always my impression that the hearing impairment was a significant contributor to their disability and to lowering their quality of life. I think it's very important to focus on trying to enhance or improve hearing and visual impairment in older people uh, because it can improve their quality of life, and particularly have, if they have depression or isolation and loneliness. Well, what you'd see a lot of the time is that people with significant hearing loss were becoming more socially withdrawn. Um, they would isolate themselves because in company it would be very difficult for them to, to keep up a conversation to hear what was going on, particularly where there's a lot of distraction, a lot of uh, outside noise. So people would tend to become a little bit more withdrawn, a little bit more isolated and become more lonely. And of course, if you get lonely, that increases your risk of, of getting depressed uh, and it can exaggerate and exacerbate depression. So we would he see individuals like this a lot and would hear that story a lot. Well, when somebody has age-relating hearing loss, there's decreased inputs from the hearing pathways into the brain. When that happens, people have to use much more resources, more concentration, and that takes away resources from other parts of the brain. So when you're focused and concentrating so much because of this hearing impairment, you're losing resources from other brain processes, and that can impair your memory or your concentration or your decision-making capacity. So we also know that when you decrease these inputs to the brain, the brain tends to shrink a little bit or lose volume, particularly in the front part of the brain. And this shrinkage or loss of volume in the front part of the brain probably contributes to the increased risk of depression. Uh, it diminishes cognitive reserve, but it also affects people's decision-making ability, what we call executive functioning, which is very much seated or rooted in the front part of the brain. Now, this is a physical thing. You can see these changes on scans in the brain in people who have age-related hearing loss. So if you take a group of people with age-related hearing losses versus those who don't have age-related hearing loss, you do see physical changes in the brain, loss of volume or shrinkage, as I said, in the front part of the brain. And we believe this is due to the fact that there is decreased input because of the hearing impairment into the brain. So there's almost like a disuse or shrinkage or atrophy, decrease in volume in parts of the brain because of this. When I'm here talking to you, there are other things happening. There are other people in the room. There, there, there's other sensory input. But if I'm focused so much on this interaction, I'm missing other sensory inputs or things that are happening. So if I'm asked to recall those events later, I may not recall them as well because I was just so focused and using all my resources to have the conversation with you. There are things happening around here uh, automatically, what we call automatic sensory processing. Information is coming in all the time, which I am using and will use. But if I have to use all my resources to have the conversation with you, I'm going to miss this automatic processing and I would lose out. My name is Ira Seema Leroy. I'm an academic geriatric psychiatrist at the Global Brain Health Institute at Trinity College Dublin. I also work at St James's Hospital in the memory clinic. And for the last six years, I've been leading the SenseCog program, which is a large-scale European research program that involves about 30 investigators across eight different countries. So in thinking about the relationship between 
aging-related hearing loss and cognitive change, one of the things we can do is think about the life course of dementia or the life course of cognitive change. In other words, right in the very beginning, there's what we call the prevention strategy and all the risk factors that potentially lead to worsening of cognition over time and the increased risk of, of dementia. And at that point, hearing impairment or hearing loss is extremely important in middle life because that's one of the most important risk factors for developing dementia in later life. Then if you move into the next stage, that's the point at which cognition starts to become more impaired. In other words, we move into a stage called mild cognitive impairment, and that's kind of the pre-dementia stage. Now, not everybody will move into dementia, but a proportion will, particularly if there's an underlying neurodegenerative condition like Alzheimer's disease. And at that stage, we want to be very careful in terms of hearing loss that we assess people correctly. So within this model of risk factors that increase your risk of dementia, these potentially modifiable risk factors, the other most important one, apart from hearing loss, is social isolation. And of course, what's really important here is that in addressing these risk factors, we need to address not just one of them on their own, but we really need to look at how they interact. Because there's good evidence to suggest that hearing loss, social isolation and loneliness all work together to increase your risk of dementia in the longer term. Well, there's a number of different ways. First of all, loneliness and social isolation by themselves can increase your risk, and there's various mechanisms whereby that can happen. Hearing loss can increase your risk of dementia, but of course, hearing loss can work through social isolation and loneliness in an indirect path also to increase your risk. So, for example, there's what we call the cascade model. So the cascade model suggests that when you develop hearing loss, you start to become more socially withdrawn. You have more difficulty interacting socially. That then potentially leads to loneliness. Loneliness can lead to depression. Loneliness also restricts your social network. When your social network gets restricted, then of course that socialization that is an important protective factor against neurodegenerative orders like Alzheimer's disease, of course, becomes a problem. So you can see your hearing loss through that cascade has led to the increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. So today we're off to Mullingar Outreach and that's held in the 1428 Club. The 1428 Club is a full-time active retirement club in Mullingar and we hold our outreach there once a month. The idea of outreach is to reach out to those people like our resource centre is in Tullamore and from the Tullamore resource centre then we cover counties Leach, Offaly, Westmeath and Longford. So we're trying to reach out to those people who, who maybe can't get into Tullamore. So what we do is we do a lot of minor hearing aid repairs. People come in with their hearing aids, I give them a check, a look over, make sure they're working as well as they can, change the tubing, battery, make sure they're clean, that the filters are clean and the microphones aren't blocked with dust and make sure the person is comfortable with using the hearing aid, putting it in, taking it out. Um, we do a lot of advice and support if someone needs um, a follow-up appointment with the HSE, we can pop that off in an email and make sure they're booked in. And it's really person-centred, so you really don't know on any particular day who is going to come in front of you or what, what question they might have or what support they might need. So we very much take the lead from the person. How are you doing? I'm fine. Yeah? I'm fine, yeah. You've got your hearing aids in? No, I've got them in my bag because I want to clean, I think. Okay. I think. And um... perfect, lovely, thank you. And how are you getting on with them? Yeah, fine. Yeah. Fine. Do you I'm... wear them every day? No, I don't. You don't. I, Why not? I am naughty. But to, to be quite honest, um, I didn't think I had a hearing problem. How long have you got your hearing aids? I've had them for about a, a year. Okay, yeah. it's usually not the person with the loss that notices that they have a loss because yeah. if you're not hearing something, how are you aware that you're not hearing yeah. it? Only that family members are saying, Mum, you didn't get that piece of information. Yeah. The TV is too loud. And it's all these little telltale signs yeah. that would equate to an age-related hearing yeah. loss. And I, I tell you, um, I'm thinking my hearing isn't too bad. Okay. Right, that's, yes. my, that's my opinion. Well, um, I do notice sometimes on the, 
on the mobile, uh, I miss when I'm talking to somebody. So I, I tend to use the landline. And put it on loudspeaker. Put, the, put it on speaker. Yeah. So That's another yeah, telltale sign. It is indeed. That, I'm just being pig-headed, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, coming, it's allowing yourself to come to terms with the fact yeah. that you have a hearing loss. And it is another piece of technology. You know, you, you get up in the morning, you put on your glasses. Yeah. We want the same for hearing aids. So you get up in the morning, aids. you put them on. Yeah. yeah. And you're good to go. I see. Did you find this was working Some for you? Some people think it's as simple as getting the hearing aids, putting in the hearing aids, and away you go. But what they don't realise is there's rehabilitation work. So people, the statistics would show that people wait on average 10 years before they actively do something about their hearing loss. So essentially your brain is missing out on all these wonderful sounds for 10 years. So then when they put the hearing aids in, it's like an overwhelming kind of amount of sounds all at once. So their brain has to rehabilitate and get used to all these lovely sounds again. I know one thing my own father was saying was the indicator in the car. He got his hearing aids, went and drove home. He never heard the indicator in the car for many years. Flushing of the toilet, their own footsteps and stuff like that. So there's a huge amount of work. You know, are they comfortable with the hearing aid, putting it in, taking it out, and allowing time for your brain to adjust. And I think that's where some people might kind of stop and think, no, it's too loud, too loud. Richard, how are you? Can't have too many complaints. And I have a problem for you. Okay. Oh. Take a seat there for a minute and gather yourself. <laughs> Oh. So tell us. Now, so you've received new hearing aids from the HSE. I did. How are they going for you? Well, that's my problem. The two of them were working the day I got them. Okay. And that one's gone on strike. Okay, we'll have a look at it. And you're finding them okay, putting them in, taking them out? Oh, they're good. It's just become routine now. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Well, so, as soon as I'm going out, I pop them in. Good stuff. And <clears throat> oh, it makes a great difference. I mean, uh, it's a lovely girl needs since where I get my paper, and at last I can hear her. Oh, brilliant! You know? <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And of course, Veronica. Veronica's a good friend can, of yours. Now we can chat. You know, she went from writing notes all the time to shouting in one ear, and now we it's, can actually have a conversation. It's magic, isn't it? So it reduces a little bit of loneliness, doesn't it? Well, it's been oh, nearly 10 years of a silent world. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, they, they do say people, on average, it's about 10 years before they notice a hearing loss. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I did. Well, I, I wouldn't be a very sociable animal anyway, but when it comes to talking to certain people... Absolutely, yeah. And you lose that completely. <gasps> and now you have that back. I have it back. Yes. Wonderful. And I couldn't hear a thing. As I say, when I was talking to my friend, she'd have to write down what she was saying. And then I could speak back, but she mm -hmm. couldn't speak to me. Oh, horrible. Horrible. Parts of it are kind of a downside. Traffic noise. But yeah. then other things, where I have a room now, the children from the school all go by to the library or to the centre in England. And just to hear the chatter, it's wonderful. It's good, yeah. Wonderful. And then you've, you've forgotten about them. Yes. You know, completely. So the brain has to nearly rehabilitate to the sound of the traffic, yeah. to the sound of the oh, children's the first, voices. Oh, the first couple of weeks were hilarious. Because if I heard a car, I thought it was right behind me coming up the footpath. <laughs> And it just takes a little while to get used to all these sounds again. It all adjusted then. Yeah. As you say, my brain kind Your of switched brain adjusts, on and said, we're yes. back, back to everywhere. It's brilliant, isn't it? The best thing ever happened. Who put us in touch with you? Veronica? Probably Veronica ringing around trying to get help. In fact, that's who it would have been. <coughs> she does everything. But uh, the first time then we drove down to... She drove me down to Tullamore. Tullamore. And Laura and yourself. Laura, yeah. And since then, it's just 
everything is gone up, up, up. <laughs> and Laura gave me the... The device. Phones and the device and the whole thing. That was the first time in many years that I was able to talk to Veronica. She put the microphone yes, up there and let me yes. do it to tap away. And then, as I say, time headed up the appointment that changed everything. The day I came out of it was just oh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. But just to hear the voice again. You know, she's the best friend I have and I hadn't heard her voice for nearly 10 years. That's a shocking thing. Well, you do more than your best. You do minor miracles every day and big miracles once a month. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. I was so glad I kept on to this thing. Yeah, I think, I think once they're aware that the service is there, you know, it's they, it's that friendly face once a month that they're not afraid to ask questions, that they're not afraid to bring in their hearing aid that might have that bit of wax, and to know that they'll be supported. And for that follow-on piece as well, like, um, not everyone knows that they have to contact the HSE for, um, you know, to get a to get a follow up appointment, so I'll bridge that gap for them as well. And I just do, I do think it's an essential service, and I suppose that's our our job as community workers that we're out in the community, we're creating this awareness that the services are there, and like that, if we're not the service for them, we can signpost them on. We offer a, a full and comprehensive range of services from, from uh, newborns right through to our old, old clients. We provide hearing tests for those patients that have full medical card for the adults, so they have to have a full medical card for the assessments there. But then we provide the full diagnostic assessments, we we'll provide uh, the appropriate hearing aids, bilateral hearing aids, and fit the hearing aids. We we'll then provide reviews to follow to make sure they're getting the best from the hearing aids. We also have a walk-in repair service or a postal repair service here. It's pretty unique in that they actually we have engineers that physically actually take hearing aids apart and repair the hearing aids. And, and then we'll have ongoing monitoring of patients to see them. Um, and if there are any issues in terms of complex patients, as I say, we will look at seeing those patients for further assessments to see how they're progressing and see if we need to change any of the man management options. And there has been quite a lot of investment by the HSC in terms of the audiology services across the country. Notably in terms of the facilities, we have now have a number of the primary care facilities that have been developed that have purpose-built appropriate uh, booths for doing the hearing testing. There are international standards that the booths should meet, uh, should meet and these are now in place in many, many uh, centres across the country. Where there aren't, they are in process of either being built or in planning stages, but it's a significant investment from the HSE's point of view. The other aspect from HSE is the introduction of a national audiology IT system. Again, that was one of the big recommendations on this NARG report in 2011. And we started off in 2017 to pilot an IT system for audiology. And it took a few years to roll out, but we had the system fully implemented and rolled out in October of 2020. We're now, thankfully, in the process where we're now moving towards having the system implemented in the acute services. So it will be one of the first IT systems within the health service which will interface both within the community audiology and with an acute service, uh, which will be all the best for the patients, I think, in terms of being able to track patients and manage patients effectively. Well, for, for a long time, uh, audiology had been under-resourced. We hadn't had appropriate facilities. The key thing, certainly for children, is you can't do a hearing test, a proper hearing test, unless you have the appropriate facilities, i.e. you need a soundproof booth that meets international standards. So there had to be an investment by the HSE to meet those specific requirements. And that was a significant input from the HSE because it had to be implemented across all services uh, across Ireland, effectively. Well, I just have them about four, almost five months now. 
takes a little bit of getting used to them, but it's getting easier. But I think it's through kind of vigilance, really, that you have to make the effort to, to kind of work with them and adapt to them and use them. I think probably uh, just getting used to the technology, remembering to recharge the hearing aids, kind of getting into a routine of looking after them. Um, I wouldn't say there was anything particularly hard about getting used to them. It's just a matter of becoming familiar with them. Well, it, it's, it's a bit like a little alien device there that you have initially because you're not used to it. It takes a little bit of confidence to get used to, you know, putting the little device in into the ear and the, re the receiver part at the back of the ear. Um, and it's just a matter of, of kind of to keep do it in, in the morning before you go out to work um, and remember to put them on. I find the days that I don't wear them, I notice it more than the days that I do wear them. Okay, Siobhan, I just want to just show you through the different designs of hearing aids that um, are available, okay? Now, we'll very often rely on somebody's test result to determine which one of these might work best for them. Okay. Sometimes when people are coming in, they've got quite a lot of anxiety about the design of the hearing aid and about the cosmetic sort of aspects. And a lot of the time they're thinking about something like these very big ones, where you've got quite a large piece that fits behind the ear, and then you've got a tube and a mould. Nowadays, that type of hearing aid would really only be suited for somebody who's got a severe to profound hearing loss. So it seems very unlikely that that is something that would be uh, something that would be required for a hearing level where someone's got a mild or moderate hearing loss, okay? When people do come for their hearing test, they sometimes are thinking about wanting something quite discreet if they do yes. agree to go for hearing aids. And then you can have these kind of models of hearing aids which are called in-the-ear hearing aids or custom-made hearing aids, or there's a few different okay. descriptions depending on the size of them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. Um, but for a lot of people, the bad news is that they're not necessarily the ones that are most so suited to the pattern of their hearing loss, oh. okay? Because you can find that they will um, overpower your low-frequency hearing. And if somebody's low-frequency hearing is a little bit uh, stronger than their high-frequency hearing, depending on how, again, the pattern of their hearing loss comes out right. in their test result, they may actually kind of go against the natural hearing pattern a little bit, okay? Right. So what an awful lot of people wear these days is something like this design. And it's kind of a smaller version of this in one way, but it also has a very soft, small tip to go into the ear. And the idea with this design of hearing aid is that it brings the sound closer to the eardrum, but also that it's, in a way, it's kind of working like a hybrid style, okay? Because it allows your low frequency hearing to just work naturally, and then it feeds in the high frequencies uh, and the amplified signals that you need to, to hear better. So the vast majority of people nowadays are wearing something like this design, okay? Yes. And they will come uh, with Bluetooth facilities, almost as standard now at this stage. So it can be regardless of technology level that you would, um, or price, let's say, but most of them will have um, Bluetooth. And again, rechargeable is kind of coming as standard. So right. these ones would have all been battery operated. Oh, let's see. Do you have any questions, anything you want to ask me about them? Uh, and how long does the charge last in those? So it can vary slightly from manufacturer to manufacturer, but in general you'd be talking about a whole day and an evening. So it could be anything from kind of 16 to 20 hours. Right. Um, but the difference with these is they will need to be charged every day. So people's habits need to be quite... Um, they need to be quite strict Diligent. with their habits. <laughs> yeah, exactly, at the beginning. And then with the other style, you'd actually have had a little battery. Right. Uh, the battery will have lasted anything from three days up to about two weeks. So it's oh, quite, it's quite a, yeah, it's quite a different change for somebody who's used to wearing something like this mm -hmm. to go to a different design of hearing And is aid. that portable? If you plug it in for overnight, for example, and you're going to be away for a long day the following day. Is it there, is, can yeah. Can you do anything like yeah, that? Yeah, you can. Well, you would have you have a little lead that will go into the back and, and you can charge it that way like you would your phone or, or any other piece for charging. But you also can get a little power pack to right. stick below, below the base. And that means then that oh. you can take this away and you get five days charge. So sometimes That's people, excellent. if they have, as you say, a, a nice night away or even a hospital visit or something like that, yes. you can use the power pack. Well, then that's for the good. Okay. And how do you oh, definitely. If I didn't wear them, I would miss half having them and uh, the first few months that I got them I didn't really say to very many people I was using them because I wanted to get familiar and I didn't want to be bombarded with questions how does it work what do you do or whatever I wanted to get comfortable 
with my hearing aids before I would say, well, actually, I use hearing aids. And I think for me, that was a good idea. Um, but my family knew and they were very supportive. So I think possibly having somebody in your corner to make sure that are you managing them OK? Is it all right? What I like about my hearing aids is that they go into the little receiver and they're plugged in overnight to charge. I'm not worried about batteries and foostering with batteries and have I to go and buy batteries. Um, I think that element of it is quite good for me. I think um, I was a little bit apprehensive because I didn't know what it would all involve. Um, the audiology tests are quite simple, they're painless and there's nothing to be anxious about. Uh, the staff were very pleasant and put me at ease and um, we had a number of consultations so I felt that they really had looked at the bigger picture of, of my a particular problem and uh, that I wasn't rushed or forced into making a decision um, so I think that was important and um, the experience was quite easy to work with because you know the times they were able to suit me for appointments and so on and um, I felt they were looking at the overall picture I have very bad tinnitus and uh, that was kind of overwhelming as well and that was one of the reasons that I wanted to look into the hearing because I had a few consultations with tinnitus as consultants that I was told actually maybe if I had a hearing aid it would assist that my concentration would be able to um, you know switch over to the hearing element and be less conscious on the tinnitus and uh, so far so good you know that has helped it doesn't cure it but it certainly is is something I would recommend people to look into if they have that particular problem. I know we're all getting more technology aware and driven, particularly since COVID times, but it can be a little bit off-putting. And I was a little nervous the first time getting them. I brought my husband along to the appointment and I had said, oh, please, you pay attention so that if I miss something that the lady says that, you know, you'll have picked it up. So, um, yes, it can be a little bit daunting, but actually they're designed quite well. They're quite discreet. They're easy to use. It takes a little bit of practice. So what I have done is built up my experience with them. So initially I wouldn't have used the sound button to control the, the sound levels on the, the device itself. I would tend to use my phone. Uh, but now I've got more confidence I can also switch a little button and, and answer my phone with them, uh, which I've only just recently started to do. And that's fantastic, too. So I would recommend to anybody who takes on the hearing aids, particularly if they're not overly technology comfortable, that they just build up um, their experience with them. Don't be too ambitious initially. Just get used to wearing them every day and getting comfortable with them. The first weekend that I had them, we went shopping and we were at the checkout. And the next thing, the lady was, you know, uh, uh, scanning the items and the, the buzzing noise of the scanner. I, I, I didn't know where it was coming from. I just jumped because obviously for the last while I hadn't been hearing that noise terribly loud. And all of a sudden it was, you know, straight at me and in, in my ear there. And I was thinking, what is this? It was just the scanner. So I suppose that's what I mean when I say getting used to them, because suddenly the sound is quite noticeable and you're aware of everything. And that can even be tiring, that suddenly you are hearing sounds more amplified than what you had been, and you have to get used to that and comfortable with it. And I think if you have a little doubt in your mind, I would recommend somebody to think about following up with an audiologist. Start with their GP and find out what is the correct way to deal with their particular hearing problem. So in Chime, we know that unmanaged hearing loss in Ireland is costing hundreds of millions of euro every year in both direct and indirect costs. So when I say direct costs, what do I mean? I mean the direct costs of caring for people who have other health conditions because they have unmanaged hearing loss. So the Lancet Commission, a commission of world experts on dementia and cognitive decline, they estimate that 8% of dementia is preventable through the early management of hearing loss in the adult population. So in Ireland, we have a high level of unmanaged hearing loss. That alone would cost 200 million plus in terms of the care of 8% of people with dementia in nursing homes and places like that. If we look at TILDA figures, which tell us that people with unmanaged hearing loss 
have higher rates of depressive symptoms. That figure is 50,000 people when we, when we extrapolate it out. In the Irish population, 50,000 people are depressed and or have depressive symptoms simply because they have unmanaged hearing loss. Now, caring for these things, these are the direct costs and these people with these health conditions costs hundreds of millions. And on the other side, the indirect costs are that these people are less alert, less able, less independent in their own family lives and communities, uh, and less able to contribute. So they are more likely to withdraw from the workplace earlier due to things like an unmanaged hearing loss. They are more likely to be unable to contri contribute and help out with family, you know, family issues. So I was recently actually talking to somebody about this uh, and I told them that the World Health Organization say that for every euro a government spends on hearing care, they can expect a return of almost 16 euro over the following 10 years. So this person I was talking to was a senior civil servant and they were asking me, how can that be? You know, that sounds phenomenal. And there's, no, there's literally nothing I know of that you can invest in in health terms and get that return on investment. So I was telling him, well, look, look you know, some of it is the direct costs of caring for people with dementia, depression, uh, increased hospitalizations and so on, because there's even evidence to show that people have more falls with unmanaged hearing loss. But on the other hand, I said it's also costs associated that these people are unable to contribute to their families and, and their, their communities because they, they have a reduced level of functioning. So for example, I was saying grandparents may be less likely, uh, less likely to be able to look after their grandchildren because they've got unmanaged hearing loss and the associated decline in function with that. And he just nodded and he said, actually, he said, my parents look after some of their grandchildren and my father does most of the caring because my mother has a hearing loss and finds it difficult to manage the children. So this is what contributes to the costs that are entirely avoidable through early management of hearing loss. So what we found was that um, hearing loss increased with age. Hearing aid use was relatively low given the higher prevalence of hearing loss and really what we would conclude from that is, given the high prevalence of hearing loss and it, the largely modifiable nature of hearing impairment, um, priority should be given to testing people early. Audiology services should be, um, should be targeting people to get early diagnosis of hearing loss, should be trying to address the barriers that exist to hearing aids and um, really that would have significant impacts on public health and would have, um, would improve the aging experience of older people. Given um, the importance of social engagement and mental and uh, well-being for older people, as certainly as people get older, I think if we can improve those in any way, it would be very important for public health and certainly diagnosing hearing loss and the use of hearing aids seems to allow people to maintain their social participation, improve their mood or certainly maintain their mental health and well-being as they age. It's kind of madness not to get a hearing aid and it's, I, I, I think it's kind of quite fascinating really how people have no problem getting reading glasses um, but people really seem to have issues around hearing aids. It is quite a significant impairment and that's why it is so important to do anything you can. And there are plenty of things that you can do. And, and I know we're talking about hearing loss here, but there are so many things that you can do to keep your cognitive functioning sharp. But a lot of them do depend on communication and preserving your hearing is fundamental to that. And it, you know, it might take people a while to realise that they're not hearing properly necessarily. And you know, I think denial is pretty common too. And and I, I think often these things can happen so subtly that you don't you don't really notice the loss. Do you know? And and the brain does adapt. Do you know? I think the 
perceived stigma that's associated with hearing loss can really affect how people behave and can affect their whole journey through hearing loss from accepting that they have hearing loss, uh, deciding whether they'll go even and have hearing tested to whether they even get a hearing aid, when and how they'll use a hearing aid, whether they actually will find it too challenging or, or too difficult to be in social situations and end up isolating themselves completely, whether they get a hearing aid or whether they don't get a hearing aid or whatever decision they've made, and they isolate themselves from society and, you know, start to experience things like loneliness, depression, um, the cognitive decline, etc., and, you know, set off this spiral that we really don't want anyone with hearing loss uh, to experience because, um, you know, it's unnecessary and it is preventable. And the sooner people go and get treatment and acknowledge the hearing loss, the better. My reaction to it was I didn't really need them, although I knew I needed them. I didn't really know why. If I, if probably wrongly, you feel a little bit uh, that that you know something wrong with wearing hearing aids. You know what I mean? But you, you've heard you've heard the, 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 the thing on television. If, if you fail to see, you get glasses. And really and truly, if you fail to hear, you should get hearing aids. Uh, I was kind of in denial of that for a long, long time, and. I don't know why, I don't know why, because I realised that uh, the effect that that not being able to hear was having, uh, was having on me. And, and I don't know why I, 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 I just had this thing about, no, I'm not getting hearing aids, I'm not getting hearing aids. And uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I've totally changed my me, me belief and, and my ideas about hearing aids now. Well, in company, if you know somebody is withdrawn, or you know someone is, 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 is in the background and not getting involved, that is a telltale story. And what would I say? I would say there's no need to feel like that and there's no need to be like that. Like, the hearing aids can uh, help you with that. They can help you to be part and parcel of everything that's going on around you, whether it be in a pub or even in the cinema. Like, there's no good sitting in your own sitting room uh, with the telly blaring, so much so that it's interfering with the comfort of someone else watching it because you can't hear. And it's so important to be on the same level as everyone else, to get involved for your own humour, for, uh, for the way you feel, and for the way people will treat you. I mean, people will stop trying to converse with you if you keep coming back to them every time saying, excuse me, what did you say? Uh, what was that? What was, you, you know, it, it, it can become monotonous for someone who's trying to engage you in a conversation if you're going to return with that answer all the time. I certainly would recommend people to look at hearing aids. I would, I would recommend to everybody who has a problem to do the proper thing initially. Don't put it on the long finger, go and see the GP or go and see an audiologist. Um, I would encourage people to look about their hearing because I think uh, for your own sanity and mental well-being and, and good health overall, it's very important that you're able to hear and be part of the conversation. If you go to a beautiful restaurant and you need reading glasses, I guarantee you, you'll make sure you have your reading glasses with you so you can read the menu. So why would you not want to go to a lovely family function or any meeting and not be able to hear? Of course you're going to, if you have hearing aids, pop the hearing aid in so you can be part of the conversation. I think it's kind of often important, you know, with something like that with hearing loss, to actually listen to what other people are saying in a very calm way. And if you are that other person, um, do it at an appropriate time. I, I think it's very important to choose, uh, to choose the time that you say something like that carefully. Not to be like me. If you think you have something wrong with your hearing, believe me, it's so life-changing 
you should really, really go and speak to somebody about it. Because it's, 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 the, the, the solution to the problem is there. It's just a matter of you grabbing the bull by the horns, going out and let the experts and the professionals find out what's wrong with your hearing and allow them to help you put your hearing right. There's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't do it because it does enhance your life. Hearing loss comes with age anyway and you can exacerbate that loss uh, through your lifestyle through the years as well as the fact that I'm getting older and, and that your hearing and your sight and so diminishes. The, the solution is there and look, just take the bulby darns and go and get it addressed and believe you me, it does change the whole outlook on your life.